Hello everybody and welcome to another video. Once again, I'm so sorry for this extremely long hiatus, but I promise I'll be posting more videos in the near future. I'm amazingly anatomical and I'm so excited to make videos on the human body and science in general. Today, we're going to go into food digestion and stool disposal. Yay! In a more scientific sense, we're going to explore the anatomy of the digestive system and diseases and disorders that can result from imbalances in the digestive system, and as usual, all from the high school perspective. Let's dive in! Like with the other anatomical systems I've made videos on, let's first talk about what the digestive system exactly is. Our digestive system is made up of our gastrointestinal tract, our liver, pancreas, and gallbladder. This system is extremely important because it turns the food and drinks we consume into energy and nutrients needed for survival. Without these nutrients and energy, which comes from proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, our body would function poorly, wouldn't stay healthy, and struggle to grow and repair cells in our body. Also, without the digestive system, we wouldn't have an efficient way of disposing excess waste our body doesn't need. So now that we have discussed the basics of the digestive system, let's move on to the anatomy of the system. To be more specific, our GI tract consists of the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, and anus. Also, the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas play roles with digestion and secretion too. The mouth is the beginning of the digestive tract, and when we chew that piece of bread or cracker, our salivary glands make a fluid called saliva, and this mixes with the food pieces to break it down into something our body can actually use. Saliva also contains amylase, an enzyme that is used to break down the starches we eat. After we swallow, food goes from the throat to the esophagus, which is located near our windpipe through our tongues. Once the food reaches the esophagus, it gets pushed down to our stomach through a bunch of muscle contractions called peristalsis. Fun fact, when we swallow, we have a small flap called the epiglottis that folds over the windpipe and prevents food from entering it. If food does enter the windpipe, that is how we choke. At the stomach level, the food is held there and mixed with stomach acid and enzymes created by glands in our stomach lining, so it can be broken down even more. Once the food is processed sufficiently, it moves to the small intestine. The small intestine is a long tube that breaks down proteins, carbohydrates, and fats using enzymes from the pancreas and bile from the liver. The first segment of the small intestine, the duodenum, is responsible for the breakdown. The jejunum and ileum, which are the lower two parts, are responsible for absorbing nutrients into our bloodstream. It is important to note that food is liquid after passing the small intestine, and after all the nutrients are absorbed, the remaining liquid moves to the large intestine. Before moving on to the large intestine, let's quickly talk about the pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. The pancreas is responsible for creating digestive juices filled with enzymes that break down carbs, proteins, and fats. This juice is transported to the duodenum in the small intestine through ducts. The liver's job in the digestive system is to process absorbed nutrients from the small intestine and secrete bile into the gallbladder for storage. Speaking of the gallbladder, it releases bile into the duodenum for absorbing nutrients and fats. Going back to the large intestine, more water moves from our GI tracts to the bloodstream inside of this organ. Additionally, bacteria in the large intestine break down any more nutrients left to make vitamin K, and the extra parts remaining become stool. Lastly, after stool is made, it goes to the rectum where it sits until we get a brain signal to release the contents or not. The anus has sphincter muscles that control our stool disposal and hold our stool till we reach a toilet. Like any other organ system, the digestive system will have problems and conditions that affect us. These problems can be temporary like diarrhea and constipation, or they can be chronic diseases that are life-threatening. Let's start with heartburn. Heartburn occurs when acidic digestive juices from our stomachs go to the esophagus. This causes an uncomfortable and irritable feeling in the chest area, and sometimes this feeling goes all the way up to the throat. Another common temporary condition people have are ulcers. They happen when there are sores on the lining of the small intestine, esophagus, or stomach. Ulcers usually happen because of H. pylori bacterial infections or long-term anti-inflammatory drugs. Hemorrhoids are swollen and inflamed veins around the lower rectum or anus. 
external hemorrhoids form on the skin around the anus, while internal hemorrhoids form in the lining of the lower rectum or anus. They can be extremely painful and even lead to rectal bleeding. Moving on to the more long-term conditions and diseases, irritable bowel syndrome, or simply known as IBS, is when the colon muscle contracts either more or less than the normal amount. Therefore, people with IBS experience cramps, extra gas, and stomach pain. Also, it is important to know that Crohn's disease is the permanent form of IBS. Celiac disease is a chronic disorder that damages the small intestine. It can happen when a person with the disease eats food with gluten, and it can prohibit the body from getting all the nutrients it needs. Diverticulosis occurs when diverticula, or pockets and bulges that form on the colon wall, push outward through weak areas in the wall. Diverticulosis is characterized as diverticular disease only when symptoms, bleeding, or any troubles occur. Just like the other organ systems, people can have cancer that affects organs and tissues in the GI tract which is why they are called GI cancers. The most common GI cancers are pancreatic cancer, esophageal cancer, liver cancer, and colon cancer. And that's the end of the video. I know that was a lot of information, but if you're interested in learning about anything else, please let me know in the comments below. Also, if you guys can, leave a like and subscribe to my channel and check out my previous videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.